What up guys, Jason Guyman here with PressureWashHelp.com, king of pressure washing, and today I have the king of, actually he's not a king, he's a wood wizard. And so uh, I want to make sure my thing doesn't be stupid here, but tonight we got somebody talking about wood and decks and how to do all the good stuff like that. You know, a lot of times I always say, I hate doing wood. I knew it was going to come up there. So let's, uh, so we're getting close to Christmas here. We are ready to uh, get ready for the new year, setting our goals. And so a lot of times people are trying to find maybe a different service to add. Maybe you want to find a niche of, we want to niche down and do one thing. And that is not a bad thing. You know, I know people that want to do everything, paver ceiling, decks, everything. And at the end of the day, usually they're not successful at anything. And Everett here has made wood a definitely his niche. That's what he does. That's mainly all he does. And so not only do they do the restoration, but they do the building. And so tonight we got a lot of wisdom on here and all of that good stuff. So the first question I'm going to have for Mr. Um, Everett is tell me a little bit about your family and how you started doing the wood side of things. All right. Well, um, family is my wife and I. Kids are all out. We're enjoying time, you know, on our deck. And uh, in these days, we try to find something local in our four states we're allowed to go to. So we've been trying to it's kind of neat because we could get to the Catskills. We did that uh, last week or two weeks ago when camping. And we're kind of finding some things close to home. We never realized we you know, that we're there. So we kind of just enjoy our time. And uh, it's really interesting. My wife and I laugh because since COVID, all the stuff with the, the COVID-19, our life hasn't really changed that much. We're still enjoying time sitting on our deck, lighting a fire on the weekends and finding these little you know weekend trips we can do. So um, as Dave uh, as, um, Flipping says, he uh, we keep the fire lit um, and, and that's what we've been doing. So, uh, we you know, how I got started, this was 29 years ago. Uh, 29 years ago. Well, that's older than some of these guys are that are listening on here right now. And then hard to believe. And <laughs> sometimes, you know, I, I still feel like I'm go back 29 years, you know, uh, until the end of the day Then I realize I, I can't keep up as much as I used to. Um, and things, but, starts uh, hurting, things starts hurting worse than what they used to, right? Yeah, they sure do. <laughs> um, but you know what? It's just like in sports or anything else, you know, you see the older players that stick around. Uh, it's because they've got a lot of knowledge and they've, they've learned the, sh they've learned the game. And, uh, you know, I never stop learning. I never stop learning from, it's just who I am. Even to this day, I try to stay up on top of things. You know, my guys in my office were laughing at the beginning of the year when I was talking to them or at the end of the year last year, I forget what it was. might've been around this time. We were talking about TikTok and TikTok blew up with COVID. So the guys are all like, I can't believe my boss is. 56 years old is on on TikTok and we, we're not on TikTok, you know. So just another example of just trying to stay ahead of things. But you asked how I got started. I was in the restaurant business and, um, you know, I had a guy doing fire suppression and uh, said that, you know, the government got involved. You got to clean these hoods every so often. You know, I can't keep up with all the work that I have. I've been trying to clean the hoods and I thought, wow, opportunity. So I go out and buy a pressure washer, a van, you know, and I think, oh, boy, this is going to be great. I tell my wife about it. And uh, she totally was not with me at all. Well, that didn't last too long. So the wife went. And when the wife went, I stuck with the pressure washing business. Now, I don't know if she did me a favor or what, but I really dedicated myself to what I was doing. I knew what I wanted. And I knew which way I was heading with it. I stuck with it. And here I am today. But I will tell you, the first deck I ever did, I blew it up. I was washing a house. Somebody asked me if I would do the deck. I said, sure. I blew it up. Did you have a turbo nozzle or just a red tip? Um, well, if I didn't have the red tip, I was right up on top of the wood. So I tell you that. <laughs> I'm doing a house. I'm I, I'd probably lie if I said I had the green tip. I might have the green tip, I might have the yellow, I don't know. But I tore that wood up. But I didn't know that next door to me was a guy who worked for Woolman who 
they had 60% of the pressurized wood at the time, Woolman wood, Wolmanized wood, and they also have stains and sealers. So he said, hey, you know, there's a better way to do this, but not like he knew how to do it. But he put me in touch with a guy named Rick Mendenhall from Woolman out in um, Copcoat, PA. And if I didn't ever have that connection, I'd never be where I am today because the the knowledge that he had and, and everything is was just amazing. And a long time ago, when the uh, PWNA had started, they were looking for a wood restoration course. Rick Mendenhall was one of was designed their first course. That was the first course I knew of anything. And back in the day, people would go online. They would first thing they would do was get a Woolman certificate. And that's the guy who put it, that program together. He's the first guy I knew that ever did anything like this with wood, gotcha. uh, whether it be an online or a course or anything. But Rick Mendenhall from uh, Woolman. That's how I got started. Gotcha. So what? So you you decided to start a pressure washing business. You lost the wife out of it. I mean, that's I've I've been there. I, I didn't lose my wife through pressure washing. I lost it before I started pressure washing. Um, so I know that story. Been there, done that. Um, but um, <laughs> what was the? Uh, why did you want to get out of the restaurant business for? Well, it wasn't so much that I I, I wanted to. To be honest with you. It's just that it got so busy so fast, I had to make a decision of which way I was going to go. And I chose a different decision, obviously, than what my my wife did at the time. And But I knew in my heart that this was the right decision to make. I knew there was an opportunity. I knew there was a call. It, it, it just – now, if, if we went back to today and I put myself in today's situation, then it's different. You have to evolve from that time to this time. I've evolved – hundred times over as, as we've gone over those 29 years. So my reasons for getting into it then wouldn't have applied today. Right. And I, I have, I have a hard time. The guys today, I mean, to make the decision to get into it today is just, it's, it's phenomenal because so many people involved, so many people are in the pressure washing industry, whether directly or indirectly through other trades and so forth. Back when I first started, we didn't even have it. In, we had the phone book. We didn't even have a listing uh, a power wash. It was water pressure cleaning. Well, nobody knew to look under W in the phone book to find pressure washers. And then if you did, there was only five of us, five people in my area. So that makes so that goes back to what you were saying earlier of never stop learning. And I always push that hard. I I, I learn still. You know, I read. You know, I, my goal is try to read one book a month. I listen to podcasts. I do all different things because I still learn, you know, there, you can never learn enough to know everything because it is changing. Cause you just said, like you were saying, you know, back in the day, you actually, it was all about who could get the biggest um, thing in the phone book. And some of these kids never even seen a phone book. And so just to show how far, technology me and my wife was actually talking about this you know when i was in high school i didn't even have a cell phone and that was in 98 in 20 years you know it has really i mean it just went and blew up on everything of how we marketing how we do all of that kind of stuff you know and so learning those things what is one thing that you found to help you stay on top of that and keep moving with it versus well my phone book ain't working no more um, I think it's probably following trends because the theme doesn't change. So like in the phone book, using the phone book as an example, the phone book, you always tried to figure out how you were going to be recognized first. How are you going to get to the top of the list? So everybody used to like if you had 20 pressure washers, they all all their names of their companies began with an A or a B and it, or it was triple A, you know, <laughs> something. So. And then when that got to be too much, they put the black bold letters and then they did a boxed out little ad. And then they did a quarter page or something, you know, so nothing's really changed. If you go online, your presence today um, and how people find you and so forth, you're still trying to get that edge. So even though the trends change and that's what you look for, the theme doesn't. So I still try to do the same thing, but I change to the trends. So if I'm looking at, like I mentioned, TikTok or something, I think TikTok has a great video platform. I think people's attention spans are just that anymore. We're used to doing a lot of long videos, and we were so proud of some of the stuff we do, and we get enamored with stuff like that. But truth of the matter is people only want to look at a 15- or 60-second video like they do on TikTok. So how do you capture people in that short of time? 
um, that kind of stuff. And I think to this point is I'm looking to make the phone ring, make the connection and so forth. And then that three minute, 10 minute conversation comes afterwards. So how do we get their attention first? And that wasn't always the way it was. So again, it's just kind of following trends as they go. Um, and then the learning factor that you just mentioned, the books, I don't care. It's just any person I talk to throughout the day, it could be a customer who knows absolutely nothing about what I do, but their perception of something might come, click to me when they say something to me that I can learn from. So I'm always looking at that kind of stuff and that kind of feedback from, from people. So no, trends, trends and don't stop learning. I agree 100%. That's one thing I always tell people. Um, so why why do why should we want to clean wood for who I mean it's a pain in the butt it's you got to use different I mean can we just use bleach or I mean I use bleach because I didn't like it you know <laughs> because you know I understand but it goes back to learning and knowing the wood and you know the different types of woods and a lot of this you have on your channel i know you've got it on your 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 youtube channel and i put the link down in the youtube into the description here so his website is on there and his um the to link to his um youtube channel and he talks about the different methods and all of that kind of thing but let's just kind of go on surface level of What's the best way to clean decks and stuff like that? Sure. So let's take bleach, for example. So I always think there's a, a good, better, best. So I'm not sitting here saying don't use you know, anything. You know, Don't use this. Don't use that. But I think what people don't realize, especially when I talk about bleach, is it's not that I'm against bleach for wood at all. What happens is bleach has a place. What I think people – where they misuse bleach is the issue. So bleach is used for a uh, non-porous surface. It's very effective. So building washing, house washing, everything like that, bleach works great with that, okay? The problem with wood is wood is, an, is a porous surface. So now we're getting away from what bleach can actually do. So bleach strength is on a, on a non-porous surface. We're asking it to work on a porous surface, so there comes the rub. So then what happens is, and you see this a lot in the posts that people will make, I used bleach, it didn't come out, I had to do it again, I had to make it stronger, I had to do it, and when you do that, the reason you have to do that is because the bleach can't do what you're asking it to do. So if you have heavy organic growth, and mold and mildew, bleach reacts with the first thing it comes in contact with, whether it be the growth, the wood, whatever, it's done. So if that mold is that heavy and it roots in the wood, which it will do in a porous surface, you may not get it all. That's why you see people that say, well, I don't like wood because of the callbacks. I, I did it. Everything came out fine. They called me three months later and it was all molded again after I had already cleaned it or after it was already stained. It's because they never really got to it. So we post treat uh, uh, other surfaces, but we never think about when we have heavy growth on wood, do we go back and post treat? So bleach could be used to post treat one. Or two, it's really good for maintenance cleaning more than anything because just like we clean a house, we could use a soap and a bleach mix to do a light cleaning, and then we recoat. But the initial cleaning, sometimes you just need a little bit more for it, and that's where I've been talking for years. It's funny because I think I'm the first person that I know of that ever talked about sodium metasilicate to use it as a cleaner or a light stripper. And now it seems like more and more people – it's becoming more universal – that people are using the, the so this. what's the difference between what you just said and like olic or i'm not olic acid um, yep what's the other wood cleaner that's uh, sodium carbonate sodium percarbonate yes okay so sodium percarbonate is an oxygenated bleach it doesn't have the chlorine in it it actually will get to the root a little bit better so does hydrogen peroxide they'll get to the root better that's a better cleaner so if you're using bleach chlorine bleach and we're calling it a good method then Sodium percarbonate would be the better method. Gotcha. Hydrogen peroxide would be a better method because it gets to the root. Because so, it's going to go deeper down into the wood and kill the mold deeper. Correct. And then if we went to like a sodium metasilicate, we're getting to more like a best method because it's more of a stronger one. The other thing, too, is you got to remember we're looking for lifting ability. We want to pull it out. We want to lift it. Bleach doesn't have the lifting ability, chlorine bleach, that like a sodium metasilicate or even – if we went further to sodium hydroxide, which is usually used in stripping, but if you diluted it down, 
you're still going to be better off than using bleach. That's what I was thinking. Sodium hydroxide. Hydroxide is what I was thinking. It gets confusing. And, you know, it's just that's another thing, too, is the world used to be what it used to be. Chlorine bleach and sodium hydroxide. Now we realize there's sodium bicarbonate. Hydrogen peroxide has been a big thing, even though it's been around for a lot of years lately. And sodium metasilicate. And sodium metasilicate, a lot of people didn't realize it. It's been around for over 20 years in this industry, and nobody even realized it because that's in the composite deck cleaners. Gotcha. And so is that a good thing to clean the composite decks with? You can use sodium metasilicate on wood or composites, and it's going to be your best way to clean. Is it going to hurt anything as much as like um – um, like do we got to worry about the plants and stuff with it or, or do we need to pre-wet and all that like we do with bleach or with um, um, the stripper one, the um, hydroxide? hydroxide? Yeah, just just pre-wet still. I pre-wet it. You know what? I always say no matter what, pre-wet all the surfaces. That's one thing in wood. It's one of the – if you took a standard in wood, the first thing is to always pre-wet all the surfaces. Never apply any of the products to any anything dry. Right. And I think we, if we always do that, we never have to worry about anything. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And if you all want to learn a lot about wood, he has a class in that link down there, just so you all know. Um, and I, this wasn't to get him on to sell his course. I just want him for the wealth of information of what um, Everett has of wood. And that's the thing that, you know, a lot of the old dogs – um, you see come and go, and you don't see many of them that have been around. But he's been around, like I say, in the days of the forums and all of those good days. And it and it hasn't changed. You know, the bickering used to go on just like it still does in the Facebook groups. Um, there really hasn't been nothing changed. Um, my wood's better than your wood and all the other things that go along with it. Um, so... <laughs> um, when I came into it, I was in it into the, uh, the late... You know, early to about 2011, 2012, and that was right at the end of the forums, but it was still the same. So, oh, I remember the forums. The forum, well, that's when you started realizing that. See, it's different now because you and I can look at each other and we can see pictures and faces now. And the forums really didn't have that kind of thing, so it was all typing. Yeah, oh my it was God. the it was the keyboard cowboys, buddy. They sure could go was. on, man. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so that is the thing that is about that. Um, and, and that is the thing, too. Somebody just put SH will destroy cedar fences. You know, it is one of those things that each wood is different. You know, there is different stuff. I had a guy. Um, well, so can I address that? Yeah. Okay. So, yes, it, it, absolutely. What happens is sodium hypochlorite bleach will take out the color of the wood. If it's left in the wood, and that's why we pre-wet it, it will dry the wood out. It, it will dry it out quicker. The wood won't last as long. You can do this in a cedar shake. If you took a cedar shake and put it in sodium hypochlorite, and then you put it in, say, sodium percarbonate, you can see the difference in how much it dries out in a quick period of time, just in your own testing and so forth. So what happens is a lot of people, if you ask them, why does sodium hypochlorite, why is it bad for wood? They usually can't give, really give you the answer why it's good, not good for wood. Usually they're just repeating what somebody else said, okay? It will dry it out. It's harsh. And the, most of the time, it's because it's misused. The Forest Products Lab has always put out a uh, formula that said four parts of water to one part of household bleach, household bleach, Expression. and then a couple of, of um, soap to be a deck cleaner. It's what happens is we're using 12 and a half or whatever. Um, we're using higher mixtures. We're misusing it. Our percentages are higher. And that's what causes the damage. So it's more the misuse. Now, one step further, for the people that don't know, the reason they say that is this. Back when they used to really do a lot of the uh, – when they made paper, they would separate the lignin, which is the glue-like substance that holds wood together, and the pulp to make paper. They use chlorine to, to separate them, to destroy the lignin. That's where the stretch is. So chlorine, yes, it will affect wood. It destroys lignin. But we're not using it in those solutions that they did to make paper. We're only using it to remediate the mold and mildew issue with the wood. So that's where you get into the rub. That's the real reason that people would say that chlorine or that chlorine bleach would destroy wood because it destroys the lignin. But again, that was used in paper making. We're not making paper. 
Got I don't you. know if that's clear, but I hope so. So that is a good point. And, you know, I always tried. So really when you're, what you're saying is when we're doing, even if we're putting a bleach solution on it, we do not need to be putting no roof mix on it, stuff like that at the end of the day. Where you want it, you know, a down, I always just downstream my house wash mix, which was a 50, 50, which was pretty, you know, it's only about a 0.75% at that point. Right. And you only need around one, 1%. They, in the forest products labs, the, the testing that they did, they found that no more, you don't need more than 3%, uh, 3%. It'll still get the mold or mildew and so forth, which I would venture to say that most of the people are putting on more than that anyway. Um, I don't know how many people, in, in all truth and honesty, really know what their dilution is right. or how strong it is right. um, You know, at the end of the day. But I'm just telling you, the, the, it's household bleach is what they recommend. And this kind of ties into... I'll give you a little nugget too. I've said this a couple of times in the past too, but for you guys that are watching this too, a lot of guys are completing composite decks and PVC decking right now. They think they know what they're talking about and they don't. If you're not sure, you should always go into the manufacturer's recommendations, but they will tell you not to use sodium hypochlorite because those manufacturers are in our Facebook groups and they're reading it and they're seeing the solutions and they see where people will say, hot mix 50 50 100 percent because it wouldn't come out and they know that that could affect the color and over a long period of time they're putting a 25 year warranty or more on all the new composite decks that are out there in pvc decking right and they're worried about the bleach content that we're using to clean with so basically that voids the warranty so if you're a pressure washer today and you're using those strong bleach chemical uh bleach solutions and a homeowner's there they smell it or they I mean, you're just taking a chance that you might be buying a deck um, because they could always go back to you at some point and say you voided the warranty. And so that's a good place to make sure we're checking that warranty then at that point, correct? Or seeing what they're telling and what their cleaning process is. Absolutely. So some of them will say it's okay for sodium hypochlorite. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Some will say it's okay for sodium hydroxide. Gotcha. Trex, the new Trex. They actually have a video. Let me show somebody. They recommend 3,100 PSI, and I don't know where they come up with that in their R&D, but 3,100 PSI over bleach. Really? That's because they're not educated either. Right. The problem with that is the 3,100 PSI, when the day he turns around and starts doing the house, and then he's got damage all over the house, especially if it's wood. So. Right, right, yeah. right. No, I like that. And somebody here put something here that I like too because it is true. It feels like feels like I'm back in school in chemistry in chemistry class and and a lot of this has to do with chemistry at the end of the day you know uh you know the ph scale all of that has is very much into this you know back in the day i could care less about it now i know more about it than than i need to. <laughs> you almost become an amateur chemist if you really get it today's market like i said we have more products today available to us especially in wood that arsenal has really changed and it changes because the coatings are all different Right. We used to we used to be all oil based. Now there's oil, water, hybrids. There's everything in between. Some of these things they're adding crazy things like urethane content we never saw in an outside product that they add to it now. So they get harder and harder to maintain. So what happens is we we're using more and more products and chemicals than we ever did. There's more available in the arsenal. So that's another thing you talk. We talked about trends. Staying up on the education and knowing all these different products and different chemicals that are being used for today's coatings is what will make somebody a lot of money in wood. So what you're saying is, Everett, is if we go in these Facebook groups, we'll stay up on the trends and we'll know everything by these <laughs> Facebook groups, right? I would say that most of the people following the Facebook groups are probably going to be the ones that are the most frustrated. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I had to push that one a little bit. So. That's all right. <laughs> you know what? I think I think the Facebook groups really give a good base of a not a good base of knowledge. It's really where you get to a certain point in the groups where you say, you know what, there's more to this, and then you start going out of the groups and you start learning. And I see those people become a lot more successful. No, you're exactly right there. So. Um, so I had a quick, here comes the question. I have one. Uh, yeah. What about wood ceilings? How do we clean those? Can I use a water fed pole as a question on it? Well, I, I tell people to stay away from them most of the time. 
Yeah, that's one. It's always a tough one. And they're always di- difficult because most people, you know, they, they, they let them go a long period of time before they address them. So if the issue is they're not getting warmed by the sun so much. So they're kind of protected. So the stain is usually still kind of, it's still pretty good or the sealer is still good on the ceiling. But then what happens is the mold and mildew. And is the mold and mildew that, and the growth, the organic growth there, is that actually on the surface of the coating or is it in the coating or even beneath it and attached to the wood? And usually that's the case. So most of the time in these cases, to be honest with you, I know it's tough, but they have to be stripped and brightened to get back to the natural wood and then redone completely. Trying to just a light clean and maybe a recoat usually doesn't look as good. Customer's not as happy. And it depends on what you're doing. So if, if I was, a cust- if I was a, uh, going out to a customer like that, I would give them two options. We can either just do a light cleaning, clean it up a little bit, make it look nice. We could apply another seal- coat of sealer. It won't be 100%. Or we could actually do it right in strip. It, and then you can price differently and then give them the option of which way they want to go. But if you really want to do it right, strip, brighten, and then when you go to seal it, uh, I know a lot of people get frustrated with a brush or a roller or whatever because it's splashing all over them. There are pads. Lamb's wool pads work great. You can put them on a stick, and you can keep it from you know getting on top of you. Um, it's a little tough area for a sprayer, so um, we use pads when we do the sealings. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit because um, on the cleaning, and, and so – kind of going down the road of you know i always charge you know the charging whatever you know i hated deck so i kept going up and up i was dollar 50 just to clean because that was where i would you know people still buy it pay it and so i kept it going at that but there's also i never even really i would only just use a light house wash mix and go with it and be done with it but what about um brighteners when should we brighten when should we be um doing it what's the purpose of brightening why why do we need to do why do we need to put the acid on there to brighten it okay a few reasons um a lot of people ask this question and then the other question they'll ask is and i'll get to that at the end of it is do we rinse it or do we leave it so brightener is always an interesting one okay so there's different brighteners most people use oxalic acid some people, if you're looking for an environmentally friendly one or a customer that wants environmentally friendly, then you're going to use citric acid. Citric acid is slow acting and it does not neutralize iron and metal stains. So what happens is when I said good, better, and best methods, oxalic acid and using an oxalic acid acid as a brightener, it's a light rust remover. It'll neutralize iron and metal stains. So what does that help us with? Nail bleeds, screw bleeds. Uh, a lot of metal furniture, if you look at decks today, a lot of people aren't putting benches on decks anymore because it takes away from the space and there's some beautiful outdoor furniture. So a lot of the metal furniture, that'll leach on it as well. The other thing oxalic acid does, if we go to concrete now, people will acid edge concrete to open up the pores of the concrete. Think about that now with acid. Now let's go to wood. A lot of people with new wood, how do you clean new wood? Okay, you just stain or seal it. Can we just just a light clean and just seal or stain it? If we clean it, no matter how we lay clean it, still use the brightener, the oxalic acid, because what happens is it opens up the pores of the wood and it'll accept the new the first time stain or sealer much better as well. So it opens up the cells of the wood. It also neutralizes any of the alkaline that we used, whether it be um, you know the sodium metasilicate I mentioned, or sodium hydroxide, whatever. We have a neutral surface. And the neutral surface going along the pH scale is better for the coating, so it'll adhere better to a neutral surface. So for all those reasons, oxalic acid is a really good one. It's quick acting. So you know when you leave the job, did you miss any spots, how good it's going to come out, and so forth, whereas you don't with some of the others. A lot of advantages to it. Now, the, the, we all heard the one with the chicken or the egg, right? What came first? It's kind of like the same argument with oxalic acid and rinsing. So people will say, do you rinse or you don't rinse? Well, you should put it on as soon as you're done while the wood's wet. You still want to put it on wet wood. Then what happens is if you talk to the forest products lab, they say no chemicals on the wood, always rinse. So the PC version would be, yes, rinse. However, take it over to all of the manufacturers and all the chemists you're going to talk to. When you talk to a chemist... They say that once you put on the oxalic acid, 
the surface is neutral, you don't need to rinse. So you have to decide as as you, what you're going to do in your company and your business. For me, I don't rinse. So you um, clean with whatever, and then you just um, you use the oxalic acid. How do you apply the oxalic acid? Do you downstream X jet it, or do you put it in? Do you twelve volt pump up something like that, or? Well, I have a theory of that. With um, for me, we have a lot of employees, and one thing we don't want is callbacks or damage done or anything like that. Um, we one thing we don't want is damage because you know today somebody's going to jump on Facebook and complain about us. So pump sprayers, pump up sprayers really help that. If it takes me a little longer to do a job with a pump up sprayer, I'm okay with that. And be honest with you, I just, I'm knocking again. We didn't get any callbacks this year or anything damaged. We didn't hurt anything. We didn't do anything. So I attribute it to some of those decisions. However, if I'm, own, if I'm an owner or operator, I definitely would use a 12 volt system uh, to to apply the chemicals or so forth or something else. You want to be careful when you start downstreaming. It can be done. But again, it gets back to the dilution rate and the true dilution rate. I've had a lot of people call me and say, hey, Everett, I did what you said, but it didn't work. And usually the issue when we really get into it is they diluted it down too far. That's why it didn't work. Right, right, right. I agree on that 100 um, percent. And that's I, I like the even the pump up sprayer. And again, it's kind of keeping it simple. And, you know, you don't have to worry about other things by doing with the pump up sprayer versus 12 volt. And then you just have that stuff everywhere at that point. Yeah. Mr. Ray put Ray from Spray Wash County. So it's kind of like rent a roof or not rent a roof. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Same thing. And Ray, Ray knows all this stuff all too well. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly uh, what it's like. Um, <laughs> um, so what about, I know we had talked a little bit about it up there, but on the roof uh, again, do we, uh, can we use, somebody asked, can we use a water fed pole up there? Is that going to make it any different or better for us? What's this? We use a water-fed pole for what? Water-fed pole on the roof. Oh, on the, the ceiling. Ceiling. You you could if it'll work. I'll use. I would use a water-fed. You'd be surprised some of the stuff we use. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We we could come up with all kinds of stuff. We and and you know what? Another thing too that a lot of guys don't use, and I don't understand why. If you talk to a painter, and you ask a painter if they didn't use an airless sprayer, they would probably. They go either brush or airless sprayer, obviously, but they would never use a 12 volt sprayer. Airless sprayer is so much more productive, and guys don't use airless sprayers, and I haven't figured that one out yet either. Why don't they use that? I mean, that's what I used. Everybody uses an airless sprayer when it comes to painting and coatings, but if you look on the Facebook groups, nobody talks about airless sprayers hardly. Every once in a while, somebody will come up and ask about one, but it's so much more productive. You get the job done. To, it's the difference between using a surface cleaner in your wand. Right, right. It just doesn't make sense to me. But and that's that's another one. The other one too with wood. And if anybody's watching that hasn't heard of an Osborne brush, O S B O R N. That's quicker than a sander. It gets off all your fuzzies. Everybody always complains about the fuzziness. And an Osborne brush is used in log cabins all the time. Log cabin guys use it. I don't know why the guys, are, you know. Or abrasive when you you post something different on a Facebook group that people don't haven't heard of or don't know about, you know how that works. Um, where do you suggest getting sodium? I can't even say the word metes and how. There's, yeah, I can't. I know, that's why I never say it because I can't we, ever say it. But and and how to mix it? You have all these chemicals on your website, or yeah, we we use we well we have a two pound containers of sodium metasilicate we use. In a smaller container uh, that does a five-gallon bucket or about 500 square feet. And then we have a five-gallon concentrate that we use. That's going to make 20 to 40 gallons, uh, depending on how much you dilute it. Um, we call it our deck. It's a restore. We call it restore. There's other companies and so forth that have sodium metasilicate, but it's going to kind of run into the same ranges we do with other chemicals. Somewhere around that 12 to 16 ounces a gallon uh, type of thing is where you're going to be. Got if you. you're got mixing raw. But you're going to have to adjust your own own solutions. Gotcha. That's good. You know, and that's one thing. I mean, I know you had said making it raw versus, you know, I used to always, even when I did my decks, I always did them, you know, pressure tech. I got a lot of that, you know, what was it, F18 or whatever it was for, you know, and I like using just some of that just so that I, ha instead of using raw, because just, you know, sometimes they have different soaps in there to help it make it do its that's better exactly thing. Right. 
And also, it's kind of the mixture ratio. It was on there. So, you know, I always felt that if, if I did screw up, I at least had something to fall back on and say, hey, look, I did it by this. You know, that could at least help me a little bit. And, you know, and like I said, you can buy anything raw at raw materials. But at the end of the day, even like you, you're putting special things in it and all of that kind of thing at the end of the day. Was that not correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and a classic example of that today is... Uh, a lot of guys are still working old school stuff. I told you about oils earlier, and the big thing was always sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide used as a stripper was for oil base. It's not effective with water base in most cases. So what happens is today now, even if we have oils, people have stepped up their game a lot. So you'll see a lot of posts where they say, hey, it wouldn't come off. You know, it, it was hard to get off. There's, you know, multiple coats even. There's all kinds of different circumstances. So what happens is sodium hydroxide is like old school. Now you, it needs help to address all the other stains. So we're actually to a point in the industry where one stripper doesn't fit all anyway. You need two different types of strippers. But the one stripper, the sodium hydroxide, everybody thinks is so great. If you're in today's market and you're trying to strip decks for using sodium hydroxide, you're going to be out of wood within a year because you're going to get frustrated. That's why people have started adding butyl to it or potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide is like sodium hydroxide, only it works faster and it'll get through those smaller molecules faster. So it gets through to these new coatings. It helps with the water base. The butyl by itself will not strip anything, but it helps boost monobutyl ethyl glycol ether. So what happens is we have guys out there today trying to, believe it or not, take sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and butyl and mix them on their own buying raw chemicals. And that's how some of these people have, I know, blown up in their face, it, you can get hurt. So that's the other thing too with raw chemicals is a safety issue. And as we're kind of up in the game, people are trying to save a few pennies and they could get hurt by trying to mix the chemicals that they don't know how to do it properly. So you gotta weigh it. Yep, I agree a hundred percent on that. You know. A lot of people don't understand the chemicals and they start mixing things being think that's okay and that is not okay to do. It will blow up. Things will blow up. You know, sodium hydroxide, you put a tub of that in a five gallon bucket, it will get so hot it ain't even fun. I mean, it is hot. And again, the safety measures of not being safety precaution of getting that stuff on you and burnt. You know, I've done three or four freaking stupid um, cabins and I got it down in my boot. And, you know, it burns down there and you got it. And then you're doing the next two days of it. it it's retarded is what. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ray, put, Ray asked a question. Could you speak about le about leaving water spots on stained soffits after cleaning them? Been seeing lots of guys having problems there. Best recommendation to get rid of these spots. Stain spots? Yeah, the staining spots on the um, on the soffits. A lot, and see, even sometimes you'll see them up underneath the roof too. Is he talking about from cleaning? Yeah, yeah. I think That's he's talking about basically where you know when you clean either underneath or you clean the um, there when you leave the 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 um, where to pull some of the stain off usually, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'll go. To, I'll, I'll address it for both ways, the way I'm thinking, though he's, he's means it anyway. So we get a lot of spots are caused from people cleaning the roofs. So the cleaner is leaving spots. If that's the case, then the only way to truly really fix that might be, especially if we're talking about wood, would be to strip that all off and start over because you've already gone through it. If you try to match it up, it's not going to work. Now, going the other way, if it's if it's is that do you think that's where he's what he was talking about? He put um, hard water spots from rinse water. Oh yeah, on is he talking about on wood? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Up You're in probably, them, you know how they have the wood soffits, and then if you get rid yeah, of water up in there, it, that's a hard one to to even up. You're not going to get very far with that at all without. Anytime you get spots, it's going to be one of those deals where you're just going to have to start over. It's a strip and brighten kind of job, unfortunately, because no matter what you do to cover it up, you'll diminish it. You may not see much. It would be great if it's up on a second floor, but you're still going to see something. Right. And that's that's the problem. And that's kind of the rub with a lot of guys that do homes or even fences and so forth. 
like I mentioned earlier about bleach reacting with the first thing it comes in contact with. So what happens is, you know, we will we'll use something and it won't look perfect. It could be the the marks on a fence from the irrigation. Um, it could be any kind of demarcations on a house. You'll get a sunny side of house and you'll get the side where you have a lot of organic growth. So what happens is even we take those hard water spots that Ray's talking about. Is how are we getting going to even this up? The only way to truly even something up and make it look 100 percent is you have to take the worst area and then how would you fix that? And that'll make everything else uniform. So if we have spots that have already stained it, then the only way we got to do it is to have to fix the whole thing. And that's not cheap or fun. No, it's not. It's hard to fix a portion, a part, or something without affecting something else. You, if you want everything to look even, which most people do when it comes to a house, a deck, a fence, whatever, anything, wood, then what happens is you end up having to redo the whole thing. Every time I've ever gotten into a situation, and, and we talk about making mistakes, every time I've tried to do a part of a job, <laughs> it's a mistake. I, it's much easier, and the customer's happier when you can do the whole thing. Right, because right. no matter what you do, I thought it was going to come out better. If you try to do those kind of things, so I don't know if that I hope that answers Ray, Ray's question. All right, all right. What's this thing being stupid for me? Um, so tell me one thing that you failed in business, and three things that you learned from it. Does it have to be in this? <laughs> well, you got twenty nine years of it, so I'm sure you've done something stupid. Well, I've done a lot of stupid things. So anyway. You know what? If we didn't do stupid things, we wouldn't get where we are today. You're absolutely right. Every mistake is a stepping stone forward. It's not a wall. So a um, couple things. Um, I had a restaurant business a few years back, not too long ago. And I was going to be a silent partner in that. And uh, that didn't work out with three other partners. So that's something I would never do again. Um I think in relationships, if you're going to be in business with your wife in doing this, I think it's probably a good idea to talk to her about your plans in detail before you just go ahead and do them. It's not good for the relationship, as I alluded to in the beginning. But I'm so glad I wouldn't met the wife. I, I, my, my wife and I, we have the best relationship. So I'm so glad things worked out the way they did. And I think that's a good point. I'm going to hit on that a little further. Of having, having that. Um, having your spouse in agreement with you, even if they think it's crazy at first and you might think, you know, that is a huge thing. And, you know, sometimes a successful business will either be successful or unsuccessful because the spouse is not in agreement with it. And you're trying to do something along the lines of that at the end of the day. Um, my spouse, when I first started, my wife, she's, you know, she thought I was crazy and, you know, it was able to keep her from working. And then, once I sold the business, I said I was going to do this, and she thought that was crazy. And sometimes it's just because they want, um, you know, some people want stability. You know, stability is going to a nine-to-five job, and, you know, this is not stability at the end of the day a lot of times. It can be very stability. You know, we can set what we make and all of that at the end of the day if we do, do good goal setting and planning and all of that kind of thing. And so I think that is definitely something – that um, we have to look at and Jason put on here I love my business partner and you know like I say it can either work good for you or it can you can tear you can yep. split everything up and you're going to have to pick one of the two at the end of the day communication that's definitely the the key to it and I wasn't good at it early on um, and then in business and, and what I currently do is you know I've learned that you know the foundation is so important no matter what we're doing. And if you have a, as you grow, if you have a weak spot, this business is going to find it. Your business will find that weak spot. So when you're building your foundation, it has to be solid so that when there is an issue, you can handle it. You know, we, we don't want those cracks in the foundation because let me tell you, if you got a wart, if you got a crack in that foundation, it's going to find it and it's going to manifest and it happens as busier you get and so forth. So I, I was just going to say, if you have a little mighty crack in it and the little, when you put it in bigger, it just gets bigger. The sure. More, it, does. it blows up. The more employees you have, the bigger it gets. 
<laughs> you know what though? You do get to a point if you do it right and you build it right. I found that like with employees, the the employees really do police themselves, right? Because they take pride in it. Right. And they don't like when somebody comes in and isn't doing the right thing or, or, or delivering the, what, you know, the result that we're used to doing. So I found that, whereas it used to be the employees used to cover for themselves, cover for themselves. And it wasn't about the company. Now it's more about, they care about the company and they police themselves. So that's where you want to get to, but I would take it also on the sales side of it. And I know a lot of people probably, uh, don't think of this as much, but the goal should be when you're building your business that customers are calling you for work. You're not going out and trying to get them. That's when you've arrived. When they're calling you, hey, I heard you do great work. Hey, I heard you do this. Hey, this. I heard you were the person. I You used my neighbor and they were, couldn't stop talking about you. So when you get to that point that they're calling us for work, that's gold. And uh, anyway. Nope, I agree 100%. Um, because, you know, when we get to our customer or when we get our employees to think that they buy into it, and that's why a lot of times I say, you know, share your goals with your employees and make them in part of the goals. Let them be part of some of your goal setting and stuff, because if they have a little bit of interest in it, you will get a lot further than you will ever think by doing it. And at the end of the day, they're good. They're going to be there's them. Some of them employees are going to be way better at stuff than you are, or they're going to be wanting to go research something better than you can. And if you think that I'm just the king of everything and they don't know nothing, well, you're going to hurt yourself at the end of the day. You're not going to grow. You're not going to be. It's you're not probably going to be successful at the end of the day. Not just share goals like you just said, but we do a Monday morning meeting every week. We talk about the jobs we did. And whether we were successful, both not just as a result and how the customer was, but how we were financially, too. So we do an exp we do a an expense uh, account on all of our expenses and how profitable we were per job. And we keep record of that and we discuss that. And then we also have our P&L and we discuss with our employees a lot of our P&L, whereas I talk to a lot of people in the classes that I teach. A lot of people really don't know their own p ls in their own business they don't even keep a profit and loss statement they wait for the accountant to do it at the end of the year where we're looking at it all the time because that's our our roadmap um how we're doing and share that with your like you said if you don't share that with your employees there's no buy-in right we didn't do well on this we got to do better and this is why this is the percentage we usually make on these type of jobs and this is what we did on these jobs you know and then you can identify things about productivity and certain employees. And, you know, you see trends where, you know, the, the jobs you didn't do as well on that, you know, same employee or two employees were working on those jobs. And that's how you find these things out. But those things, like you just said, sharing and, and opening up this, you know, when I work for a court, I used to work in a corporate environment. That's how I got to this. So when I was in the restaurant business, P&L meetings were a common thing and it was shared. You know, between all of management and levels of management and so forth, I mean, it was a big deal. And if we're going to run our own businesses, shouldn't we do that also? It would just make sense. We'd all be more successful that way. No, and that, and, and you know, people, well, I don't want to do that or I don't even know. And, and if you don't know it, that's an issue. You don't even know what. And even kind of like what you were saying, if you find the same two employees, then we can look at, all right, is it an employee issue? Is it a training issue? Is it? We can break that down and figure out where it might be. Maybe it's a training issue. Maybe they don't know what to do in the right way to do it or something. You know, just because we trained them two, three, four times doesn't mean that they got it in their skull. You know, sometimes we got to train over and over and over. But then a point, there comes a point that we got to let them go eventually if they're not going to be able to figure it out. Yep. When we do the P&L statement, we take it from sales, we take our you know, revenues, then we take our expenses, but then we stop at what we call the uh, controllable profit line. So anything that we can control above and sales and so forth, that's what we talk to them about. The, the, un, the uncontrollable um, expenses, you know, whether it's mortgage, rent, you know, different things, trash, that kind of stuff that we take care of in-house. And then actually what we our profit is of our company, we don't talk to them about. Right. So we stop at that control we call the controllable profit line. And if you include your your employees with that controllable profit down to that controllable profit line, I think that's where you stop. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, 
Southeast put, we are very vocal about PL. It encourages our folks to stay engaged and also helps to incentivize them to hit their goal, their own goals. So, um, the, um, Donovan put on here, what are some things you have done to improve employee um, um, attitude? Um, well, there's a whole bunch of things, actually. Um, we have a couple of ways we tier people as far as the money part of it. So we do the commission and we also do bonuses and it's based off of jobs and goals we set for each job. So there's those. The other thing too is what we've done in my area, we have Amazon. Amazon is paying $18 an hour with benefits to start. For me, it doesn't matter to me because we're kind of already there anyway. And we have, we try to with our business model and the employees we have, we do the same kind of thing. So we're right there anyway. We'll do the 18 and we give them benefits. We also have a 401k set in place for them too. So I know a lot of companies, especially startups, or you know, they struggle to get these things in place. But we've been around for a while, so we're able to do a lot of that kind of stuff. And then when we talk about other business morale and stuff, it's the things that you go above and beyond. Um, one of my guys, I just just for example, on Saturday, um, he came in and we worked a half a day. And I actually took the time to actually write a letter. And I know people don't do this. And I wrote a letter and let him know how much he was appreciated and how proud I am of what he's done for me over the past 10 years. And I don't think anybody does stuff like that. And when I got done and I handed him the letter, you know, and he, he you know, gave me a pat on the back. And, you know, it, they're the kind of little things. I'll bring guys that will come in sometimes on a Saturday. We'll sit on the deck come over to my house, sit on the deck and we'll barbecue and eat that kind of stuff. And I think that's kind of the, uh, the, the nice little stuff we do. We'll come home, you know, we'll tell everybody, they'll get a text message on a Friday. Hey, everybody be back at the office by three o'clock. And then they come back and we got a bunch of pizzas in, you know, in the uh, conference room, that kind of thing. So they're the kind of little things you do. So you're always trying to I guess at the end of the day, you're trying to balance both the the financial, obviously, part of it and the incentive part of it because they need to make a living. But then it goes beyond that. And it's why do they want to stay here? Why do they want to work for you? And it's it is the little things. And you have to create that culture and bring those two things together. It's all, it's all, no, it's all about the little things. And again, like you said, it's not always about money. You know, I had guys we paid good 25, 30 bucks an hour and they wouldn't stay. We paid guys $15 an hour and they'd stay forever. If you did other things, you know, you rewarded them for other things. You do other things for them. Not just money either. You know, like you were saying, that note, pat on the back is goes a long ways further than what you think as it does. Having them put input into your business is something that can have input that will help you keep employees in that. Now, I'm not saying they're going to make big decisions, but, you know, you can sit down and say, what are your goals, you know, and how can I help you reach your goals? You know, if somebody's got a goal, they want to buy a house, then you can say, here, I can help you have knowledge and do things so that you will be able to do that or give you, you know, stuff like that. And that will go a long way at the end of the day and will help them be successful. Absolutely. All right. So. We are at 90 people. We've been up to about 95. We're getting time here. So if you was getting, if you were to start over, what would you tell yourself as a new person? What, what are some things to do about wood cleaning and deck cleaning and, and just the deck industry as a whole? Uh, I guess you mean starting today or starting over? If you just started today uh, as a new guy starting decks, yeah. cleaning decks, cleaning and sealing decks. I would definitely say educate yourself no matter how you do it. And I don't care whether it's a Facebook group, a YouTube page, whether it's taking a class, whether it's going on Amazon and finding books. Uh, there are some really good specific books on wood, like the Encyclopedia of Wood or the Wood Handbook that the Forest Products Lab puts out. And treat it like it's a college course or a course you're taking and educate yourself on so much. Um, I didn't realize in the beginning i thought hey i know how to do this stuff and my craft i'm really good at what i'm doing i deliver good results and so forth and that was i thought that was kind of it for a little while and then i realized that as i started educating myself 
my customers were kind of just following along. So what happens is now, and I, I'll bring up Shane Brousseau because I've known him for a long time too down in Texas. He's a great guy and uh, one of my favorite guys. Um, I wish he was next door to me because he's been such a good friend over the years. But when we, we were in Houston one time together and we were talking, it was like everybody was like thinking we're t- talking a different language. And what happens is when you really know your craft and you can go out and talk about say pressure treated pine and the characteristics of it and why it's green, why resins come out of it, which only come out of pine, or you're talking about cedar or epe or mahogany. And all of a sudden your education that you've taught yourself comes out. Your customers are like, this is the guy, this guy knows his craft. He knows his stuff. So you teach yourself, you educate yourself. And then that, that all comes out. It's all part of your presentation. It becomes who you are. And then that's when you start getting recognized. I didn't realize that in the beginning. I thought it was just, if I deliver a good result, I'm going to be good and I should get paid and and I'm the best. Now, that's really not all there is to it because somebody else can deliver just as good a result probably than you. So what separates you? I can put knowledge behind it. I can put meaning behind it. I know why we're doing it this way. And then what happens also is, to put, put it bluntly, when the shit hits the fan and it does on some jobs, that education kicks in and you remember some of the things that you were taught, you learned, you know, ideas that you've had and so forth, where, and that'll separate you from the others. So if I could do it all over again, I would put more emphasis in the beginning on educating myself. And I think that kind of ten, goes back to what I was saying earlier about the foundation and not having any cracks. It makes your sound, your foundation much more solid. And I, I, I took advantage of that when I was younger. I just thought, I'm going to bull through it. I'm going to do it and so forth. So that would be mine. And I think it's just more and more in wood specifically. I think it's more and more important now because the coatings are changing so much. And if we don't stay ahead of the products that are, are, are out there, then we really don't know how do we clean them? How do we strip them? Do we strip this one off different than we strip this one off? So the education really, really is important in wood. But if you get to that point, um, I mean, sky's the limit because nothing's, you know, I'll give you another thing that real quick that people don't realize. If you're thinking about getting into wood, everybody thinks that everybody's going to engineer products and composite and so forth. Composites two years ago only made up 11% of the market. That's it. 11%. 89% was still wood. And everybody had this fallacy that it, the wood's still here. It's been around. It's going to be around. Even if you did wood today, a deck, it's going to be 20 plus years. So there's a lot of job security. There's a lot of stuff going on with wood. A wood home's going to last for a long time. And then t- this year, the statistic is 20%. So even with COVID, even with people putting more composite decks out and so forth, it bumped it up to 20 Plus, they did come out with some cheaper lines of the manufacturer. Trex and Timbertech came out with cheaper lines, only three colors or four colors, and that kind of helped the percentage. But still, 20% is is composite. 80% is still wood. So the market's there. The money's there to make it. It's just a matter of whether or not somebody wants to educate themselves and get into the niche either as a service or as a full business. No, I agree 100%. And even talking about the education and stuff, it isn't just about the wood either. It's about marketing. It's about um, pricing, all of the stuff that goes along with it, you know, because a lot of people get into wood and and they do the decks and they, they bid them and they underbid them so far. It ain't funny because I would never pay that much. You're right. You're not your customer. And I've said it over and over and over and over and over is you are not your customer. Quit thinking that I would never pay because you're right. I would never pay that. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that will pay a lot of money for um, for that. So, um, again, I think that can be really good. You know, I, I've just had my deck built. Wood has gotten stupid expensive this year. What the hell is up with Brass. that, Everett? Well, I can tell you a couple of things. One is we got into the COVID, so the supply. So we just, everybody went out, they bought a bunch of wood, there was no wood. And then what happened is we got into fire season and they weren't cutting the wood. So not only did we use up the supply, we couldn't get anything to come back in. 
So then they start, they start cutting at the end of the year. I don't know that it's first quarter of the year. They even get caught up on some of the wood. I see some more wood coming in now, but even the wood we were getting was pretty green and pretty rough. Gotcha. So that's really what, what happened. But we couldn't keep up with the supply this year at all. So. All right, I got one last question from Mr. Jack sure. Garrett. Um, did anybody ask about the fuzz yet? That's what I was talking about earlier with the fuzz. So fuzz comes usually, usually. There is some natural fuzzing on wood that's nothing you need to do anything about so the grade wood whatever you're going to get some fuzzing how are you going to deal with it is is the issue usually though when you have excessive fuzzing it comes from leaving the chemical on too long or it was too strong that'll fuzz up the wood too but i alluded to earlier that osborne brush o-s-b-o-r-n osborne you can get the brush goes on a grinder you can get them on amazon you get them other places and so forth figure them between 60 and 100 dollars they come in a four inch and a six inch wheel and then what happens is they come in 80 and 120 grit and what happens is when there's it's abrasive but what happens is it's a cup and then when you put it on the grinder it opens up and then you run that on the wood surface and it'll it's like using a surface cleaner on concrete only a surface cleaner on wood so that osborne brush will help get rid of those fuzzies and so forth pretty quick and pretty easy so also, high pressure will uh, make some High pressure too. can fur the wood up, obviously. And I got one last question because this guy asking. I, I always got to love it. Go do ahead. I, do I use hot water on wood? Okay, now that's really a funny one too. So <laughs> the answer to the question is no. Hot water raises the grain, right? So if you're ever going to – so say you put on uh, – you're going to strip off a fresh coat or something like that. 120 to 140 degrees, something like that. Use about 120 degrees would be the right amount. If you're going to use warm water. It does help. Also, warm water will help, believe it or not, delaminate some of the coating. So you get a solid coating or some of today's coatings with that deck over and some of the hard ones that have ceramic pieces in them. Right. Warm water will help delaminate them to help them come away from the wood. So it helps. So anyway, the, the, the idea with hot water is that it raises the grain. I will tell you this. The answer to that is true. It does raise the grain. But the chemicals that we use will raise the grain as much or more, especially if we leave them on there too strong or too long. So we can raise the grain with strong chemicals the same way as we do with hot water. I think the answer to the question is if you're going to use – I wouldn't use hot water. I would use warm water. I'd probably be around 120 degrees if I were going to use it. It would be for a specific purpose. Awesome. Awesome. All right, tell me what all I can get at your store and everything that you offer for my sure. listeners. Sure. So um, the Deck Restoration Plus products, we have six colors right now. We're going to go to 11. We're adding uh, five new ones this year. It's a water-based stain that actually uh, performs more like an oil. It's penetrating. It actually goes into the wood. It doesn't sit on the wood like traditional ones. And then we have all the products that we can to restore it, including – our new Stripper Plus. So we have Stripper and Stripper Plus to help with those coatings I was just talking about, the deck over, some of the water base, the ones that are a little harder to get off. We have two different types of strippers now. Then we have the Restore, the Deck Cleaner. We also have House Wash, our detergent, and then um, our brightener. So that's our store. Plus we have the education stuff. We have the three-day boot camp, or you can take it online, which we basically have put that in that three days. So it takes about 20, 24 hours to take the uh, online course as and well. And in your three-day so, class, it's actually hands-on, right? They get hands-on stuff, correct? The boot camp is hands-on. I don't know if you've seen it, but we've built a, uh, a training deck. Mm -hmm. Half of it's composite on one side. Half of it is four diff five different types of wood on the one side. Then we also have logs in the back. We have fencing. So for cedar siding, so we're able to do all the different different types of things we would see out in the field. And it's better to train. I mean, if you can train on a deck rather than train on somebody's property, it's right. one it's a lot better. But even if you didn't take the class, I always tell people train on a pallet, train on section. You see sections of sitting on the side of the road, throw them in the back of the truck, take them back and practice on them. You know, at your place before you you practice on somebody else's. Awesome. Awesome. So go check it out. I've got the links down in the description here. Um, 
And I appreciate you coming on, Everett. You've given a wealth of information. I always like, like I said, between you and Shane are the two that I'm always like, if you got wood questions, go ask them because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and it's not that I don't know. I know a lot about it, but it's not my craft, and I don't really care about it as much as I do with the other side of things. So um, I know it's your got both of your all's as craft. And I always like Shane because he's another one that will help anybody if you ask and all that kind of thing. So great, great guy. Um, so, so I appreciate you coming on. And uh, if you got any last words, we'll get off here. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and having me on tonight. And uh, I'll be talking to you soon. Awesome. Let me end this here, and then I'll.